guys for, for coming today. I see some of our Hope people, some of our LifeLink folks, so thank you guys for, for coming out. Um, real excited that we're able to do this. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with, with the Eagles, the Gathering of the Eagles? So the Gathering of the Eagles group is the the top 100 or the biggest 100 systems in the in the country, and they're medical directors. And they get together every year, um, and they discuss what's going on in, in EMS. Um, they have a big big conference every year where they talk about um, all the different things that are going on, and they really are a huge driver um, in in the progression of EMS. And last year, the year before, I can't remember what it was. Um, but I was sitting at a national conference and listening um, to them do a panel discussion. And they're always very careful about some of the comments that they make and they qualify a lot of their stuff. Uh, but they flat out said, whole blood is probably going to be the biggest uh, change or the biggest impact, most impactful thing to happen in EMS uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, and, and so, I think it's huge that we're able to able to bring it here. Um, the hospital has been very, very receptive and very pro uh, doing this, and so uh, it's. I think it's going to be it's going to be a tremendous thing for us to have. Um, hello, come on in, come on in. Um, so I'm I'm equally excited um, that we're able to get uh, Dr. Patini here. Um, known Dr. Patini for a couple of years now. Um, back way back in the day when we were both in Oklahoma. Um, Dr. Patini was an ER doctor up in Tulsa. We used to fly our patients, our massive train wreck of patients, um, up to up to their facility at St. Francis. Um, and so, uh, when I got to Onslow and we started the blood program there, and I reached out and uh, found that Dr. Patini was was involved, um, I was really excited. So one of my first calls when when I knew we were going to be able to do a blood program here um, was to reach out to Dr. Patini, and so. He's gonna he's gonna talk a lot um, about blood. We're gonna we're gonna start from the basic and work our way all the way through. Um, this is really intended to be a learning piece. Um, today is gonna be hands on um, with with a warming system, um, how to set up blood. So please ask a lot of questions. Yesterday's group did really well. Um, they they asked a, a lot of really thoughtful questions. Um, so this is your time to learn. So ask all the questions while while you have you have the expert here. Um, so <clears throat> I will turn it over to Dr. Patin. Thank you, Dave. Well, speaking of expertise, um, I, I came here yesterday and you know I hadn't talked to David live in quite a while, and I said you know it's, I think you're the only chief that I know of across the country that's done two blood programs as the chief. And he corrected me, so this is number four because he's been instrumental in one, two other programs. So that's very unique because we're still in the infancy of this. So I want everyone to be totally excited about this because you are still in that kind of pioneering group. We've proven this works. This really impacts patient outcome. But overall, across the country, we still have about 100 or fewer EMS systems that are actually doing this and giving um, blood, let alone whole blood. So I'm going to walk you through things from start to finish and really give you a good background on where all this came from, how to really execute this, um, but you know, know that you're starting in a system with a very well-seasoned chief that has stood this up from ground zero. Most of those hundred systems, I might caveat, are located in Texas and kind of came under this Texas model. So there was Oslo County, actually, when David started that one, was one of the earliest ones outside of Texas and outside of the, the model that had been located there. And the rest of us that have stood up programs and followed on with that lead. So my background a little bit here is that I am an emergency medicine physician, but I started my career as an EMS. I was an EMT. I was a paramedic in the Boston area, crossed over into nursing, um, and then did my emergency medicine residency down at Parkland Hospital. Paul Peppy, who was my chairman, was the guy who started the Eagles, so we were very EMS heavy, um, which was great for me because I came from an EMS background. In uh, 2014, I uh, had gone to the Department of Defense with an idea that I had when I was a paramedic for normal thermic infusions in the field. I actually went to them a few years before that, um, but the DOD had picked up on the technology that I had conceptualized and said, we'll lean in if you think it's possible and we'll fund the development of this. And that's what led 
me to have to step away from full-time emergency medicine and be the primary investigator on this project that spanned almost four years to bring the new warming technology forward, which is a complete change of warming technology having been for the past 30 years to make it very simple and intuitive. So it's carried by, across all of our special operations, the uh, majority of the blood programs um, use it just because it's a very simple and effective setup to, to use in my way. So one of my disclaimers so that you know is that I am the chief medical officer for the company that is commercialized um, the product. But because of this involvement I've had with DOD, that actually started in 2012, I had a lot of visibility on pre-hospital blood administration, particularly whole blood, because DOD really shifted over towards the mid to the end of the conflicts to make point of injury, transfusion, and walking blood banks. Um, so I was around a lot of those people. And then when San Antonio launched, they had me come down before San Antonio Fire um, actually launched the program to kind of begin on the meetings with that. So I had a lot of visibility. And since then, when systems have reached out um, and are standing up programs, you know, they, I'm just kind of a point of contact. So I get to see one of the benefits is I get to meet a lot of great medics along the way and I get to see and compare notes. We're very like-minded, all of us that do blood programs. My own system in Hartford, we stood up a whole blood program um, a little over a year ago. We've done 42 field transfusions with that program in an urban environment. But we're all very willing to share. You know, David shared with me and with other programs, and we just all tend to share to try to elevate the EMS part. Very informal, if you have any questions along the way, because I know a lot of this is going to be new, newer material for everybody, just feel free to ask. You know, you can hold it towards the end, but if it comes to your mind, I don't mind if you just ask out the question, because somebody else is probably thinking the same. So I'm going to go through what, what we are really doing here is pre-hospital damage control resuscitation. And I'll go through the main tenets of that, but that's really what you're stepping into when you bring blood into the field on top of hemorrhage control. And understand its main tenets. What are the differences? Why are we switching from clear fluids like crystalloids into uh, blood? And why whole blood in particular is the resuscitation fluid of choice for hemorrhagic shock? And so logistical considerations and why that it's matter in transfusion even in an urban environment. You know, a lot of questions we get, those of us that stand up blood programs, is wouldn't this matter more if the transport times were longer? Uh, and that's actually not true. You know, it, it's it's great for all environments and it does matter in an urban setting. Is the screen adjusted for anybody? Is there any glare on it? You guys need me to change it? Yeah, everybody can see. If you can't hear me, let me know. I'll, I'll talk up a little bit better here. Um, but just to start with a basic case to get things going. So I'm going to show you a case. I'm going to take you through some background material, show you a video. We'll take a break, finish up. Then we're going to do some hands on with the uh, quantum uh, warming system, which is the transfusion system. So these are cases that we've had in Hartford so far. And this was a 31-year-old male with a gunshot wound to the left knee who was sitting in a, sitting in a car who had just massive blood loss pulling in the car. He was kind of altered uh, in his mental status when they got there, but it appeared very apparent to the medics that he just had uncontrolled bleeding from a major artery in his knee. Um, and he was unconscious, he was unresponsive, profusely diaphoretic, basically in a peri-arrest state. They could just barely palpate the carotid pulse, so they got him out, laid him supine, put a cat tourniquet on, noticed a very large tissue defect. And those of you that just see you know, our run of the day civilian shootings with nine millimeters, we don't get really huge tissue defects. This appeared to be a 45 or a 40 cal that blew out the popliteal fossa. Um, heart rate of 128. His end title was low at 26. So they put a cat tourniquet on, ALS arrived, they put an 18 gauge IV in. He had pretty limited access to his shock state. They gave a unit of warm whole blood during transport. Um, and when he arrived, he had a change from these vital signs to these vital signs just with that one unit of whole blood. So you'll notice when you get into this and start doing this, those of you who've been in for a long time, you used to give a crystalloids, right? We get bumps in the blood pressure. Whole blood in particular, we get some really good changes in the hemodynamics with a very smaller uh, volume of fluid. So whole blood units vary somewhat in the fill. Like if we did a collection in the field on a military end, it would usually fill to about 475 mLs. The blood banks that supply whole blood 
the, the ones we get up north are 570. It's 500 units of blood plus 70 mLs of the anticoagulant. The ones you're going to get down here probably going to be in that same range of either 520, 540, or 570, depending on how they do it. So it feels like a very fat 500 mL bag. But remember this, it all stays intravascular, right? So we think of the old days of this three to one crystalloids to the volume loss to kind of equate for a little while, then it goes outside of the vascular space. So the whole blood, is exactly what you bled out is exactly what you need to come back. So when this patient arrives, I think, and this is a busy slide just because we review in detail with our medics on the blood team. So I put a lot on the slides. I didn't try to make a crappy slide for you here, but it's just one that we use for inside blood. An important part when I was a medic is whenever we, and this is back in the 80s, right, is that it was great when we had visibility of what happened to the patient after they got there. And over the 30 years since I was active in the field as a medic, I still am a medical director and do all this, but um, so much has changed. And EMS drives hospital policy. Like, so if you think of some of you that have been here longitudinally, right, we didn't really use CPAP or BiPAP in the ED. We intubated. EMS started using CPAP, and we were like, shit, this is actually good. We decreased our intubations. And that was totally driven by EMS, right? Um, we never used IOs. We'd always go for the central line. We would start getting easy IOs or whatever come in EMS. So we started stocking IOs. I'm like, you know what? We can get by sometimes as a great bridge or not using the central line. As the chief said, this is one of the more meaningful things that are going to um, impact care. So even our trauma center where I'm at, it's a level one, the trauma surgeons have wanted whole blood. But until we lean in and said, let's start a whole blood program, that was the catalyst with EMS carrying whole blood that now we can stop whole blood in our trauma center. So it'll be the same thing, and you're living through an incredible transition here, and this is a very safe process. At the end of the day, I'll jump ahead. When we go through all this, and the protocols are in place, it's no different than if I were to say to you, if I was your medical director, under these certain parameters, I want you to grab this 500 bag of lactated ringers. I'm just gonna want you to grab this 500 bag of whole blood. And we're gonna get so much bang for the buck for the patient for that. But it's really that safe at this point with how we're doing this. So to give you some visibility on hemorrhagic shock and how what we do in the field impacts what we can do with the patient, I want to bring in early on in this talk, reinforce it, and then you can look at it later, this lethal triad of trauma that occurs with hemorrhagic shock. And this lethal triad of trauma is what kills the trauma patients, and it also limits the ability when they go to the OR, how far they can go in the surgical part of this. And the lethal triad of trauma consists of the patient getting cold, it's hypothermia, it's related to blood loss, they get acidotic, which changes their acid-base balance, and they get coagulopathic, meaning their blood isn't gonna clot right. So all of our, so most of our chemical reactions in our body, but particular to the clotting process, are temperature dependent and they're pH dependent, acid base dependent. So the more we can keep those in this kind of tight range, you know, as humans, we have very tight ranges for certain things. So temperature uh, and pH are very critical in trauma patients because if they're out of range, meaning low, uh, we're going to have a lot of difficulty with that patient sustaining them through what they have to go through once they get into the OR. So everything you do in the field to prevent that lethal triad of trauma helps the outcome of the patient and it helps get them to the next step. So when this patient arrived, he had a decent blood pressure. He was, compared to where he was at, he was mentating, and his arrival temperature was really good. This was March 10th, and in Hartford, March 10th could be cold. This is at night. Um, these labs may not mean a lot to you right at the moment, but you know, lactate, oops, did this yesterday. Um, Lactate is a marker of shock. You know, it's lactic acid is built up. It means we've had inadequate perfusion of tissue. So his lactate was high. His international normalized ratio, which is a mar marker of how he's clotting, is elevated. So he's already acidotic and he's coagulopathic. And we confirm this with a, his pH is 7.2. That should be 7.35 to 7.45. So we already know, other than he's got two legs of the lethal triad, but his temperature's normal, which is great. So he ends up getting a couple more units of blood in the ER. The cat tourniquet is still in place. 
but this lies because he got fairly well resuscitated. He arrived with a blood pressure. He started with no blood pressure. It lets the trauma service have the luxury of walking from the trauma room with the patient next door to our CAT scan. And anything that they can determine before they get to the OR that's reasonable helps them plan their surgery. So this bought this guy some time. He's resuscitated. The hemorrhage is stopped. And you know, plain films, he's got an explosive fracture here on his proximal tibia. On the coronal cut of the CT, we can see, okay, this is a little more, it's just pretty explosive looking. And then um, on a sagittal cut, we see the cat tourniquet was loosened up so that we could let the contrast, which is white IV contrast, go down. And, you know, his popliteal artery should not abruptly cut off right here. We need to see this blue out his popliteal artery that was free flowing. And everything's tight together, and then he developed and required fasciotomy. So the end result for this patient, unfortunately, was that he did lose the leg about 48 hours later. They, they tried their best, they bypassed him, and they exfixed the fracture, but he ended up having a nerve injury, plus a vascular injury, plus the fracture, plus compartment syndrome. Those four together, it's almost a guarantee you're gonna lose the leg or it's gonna be unfunctional. So the patient, when he was in better shape in 48 hours, was given the option, and he opted to have a very controlled amputation that would allow him to have a prosthetic. But this speaks towards damage control resuscitation the way it needs to work. So stop the bleed, prevent hypothermia, and an early blood-based resuscitation to prevent and to treat the acidosis. How did this come into the EMS world? You know, why is it here in Cumberland County and across other the country? This has become a real topic to get these blood programs up and running, and there's challenges to them. But it's basically built off of the military experience. And the one thing we've had in the 20 years of conflict that just <coughs> kind of came to an end is that there was a lot of attention paid, particularly in the first 10 years, of what is a preventable death on the battlefield and how can we influence that. And when you looked at it, a preventable death is one that if all the care was optimal, this person would be expected to survive. So it's not somebody with a catastrophic neurological injury or a catastrophic cardiac injury, they're not gonna survive. But what are the ones that are dying that could have been, and the vast majority is hemorrhagic shock, okay? Then after that, it's airway. So this was in the early part of the war, 25% of all deaths were preventable, and most of those were hemorrhagic shock. So this is what brought the studies back in with tourniquets and started feeling tourniquets and made huge impacts. So then we looked at this and said, on the civilian trauma system, if we apply that same number and we're not optimizing care on the civilian side, we're really talking about tens of thousands of citizens on the homeland that experienced trauma that could survive if care was optimal. So there was a white paper put out by the National Academy of Science that called for the zero preventable deaths based on the military model. And one thing in the military model was, these preventable deaths, it's not really what we do when we get them to an aid station or back through the echelons of care, it's what's done in the pre-hospital phase that has the most meaningful impact on the hemorrhagic shock. So on the civilian side, it's the same thing. We stood up, we have good trauma centers stood up in most urban areas. But if you can't get a patient who's viable, you know, arriving viable at the trauma center, it doesn't really impact the survival. So this kind of, overlapping aim here is that we mold or melt together what we learned in the military experience into the civilian trauma system, the best practices, and it helps everybody. It helps survival on the civilian side, and it keeps us ready in the interwar periods for sustainment of these skills, because they're always lost after conflicts, it seems. So there's good buy-in into this. The majority of these preventable deaths are from hemorrhage. Um, you know, we, we haven't seen a lot of these type of mass cows where we get these injuries with uncontrolled hemorrhage, but you know, I think, and this is more of my neck of the woods, but you know, the Boston Marathon bombing with the pressure cooker bomb kind of laid bare that we need to up the game on this hemorrhage control. You know, Boston EMS wasn't carrying ratcheted type tourniquets when this happened. They used kind of a rubber band with a forcep thing. Uh, so we had civilians just intuitively were holding pressure of applying makeshift tourniquets. So we've gotten pretty good at isolated extremity hemorrhage control in the years since then. Tourniquets have become very ubiquitous from police officers, stop the bleed kits in airports. Um, but junctional hemorrhage, which is non-compressible, you know, there's really not a lot of good things here yet that we can do 
Um, and this is where blood really comes in uh, as far as hemostatic resuscitation and possibly adding TSA and a couple of other interventions. So damage control resuscitation really revolves around these highlighted tenses that we can control the hemorrhage early on. We allow for the blood pressure to be lower than normal. Um, some permissive hypotension and minimize the use of crystalloids if we can. Control hypothermia, this should be on the forefront of your mind. I'm going to give, dig deeper into this in the slides to show you why that's important compared to what we think of like just primary hypothermia from the person who passed out behind a liquor store versus a trauma patient who's dropped a couple of degrees. In early balanced blood based resuscitation is now a reality for EMS. So, do you have any current or former service members here? Medical. So, which side of the screen do you identify with? I don't know, I was coming out. I was a medical. <laughs> All right. So, the left side has been the trauma assessment in in military medicine, probably since the late '90s, right? Where massive hemorrhage is prioritized over airway, which sounds a bit heretic to people, right? Usually, in the civilian world, we've done airway breathing, circulation, disability, and exposed the patient just recently added environmental control, otherwise keep the patient warm. Whereas in military medicine, it's focused on massive hemorrhage, airway, respiration, circulation, and the age in March is hypothermia prevention, head injury. And this just makes more sense when it's been looked at that on the battlefield, preventable deaths, a huge percentage is from hemorrhage. Then it steps way down to airway. So why would airway matter if they're bleeding out at such a rate that you're not gonna have a viable patient. And it doesn't take one just to get quick control over an airway. And again, I'm speaking from my experience in, in a system I work in that could change locally. So I, I you know, refer you to the chief um, who will be up here for the actual guidance on your assessment. But this seems to make a lot of sense. A massive hemorrhage really means, you know, not a little losing wounds, you know, go to airway on those patients that don't seem to have much visible. When you show up like the guy in the car is just exsanguinated without pulses, we're not going to look listed and feel. We're going to get a tourniquet on first, and then we're going to do the airway and go down with the march out. So damage control resuscitation, again, bringing it back to how this impacts the patient when you get the patient to the hospital, right? So for myoptic, and we only look at the pre-hospital time and what we're doing to the patient, you can do a good job, but you really got to look at you're in the continuum of care of these patients. The ultimate goal is to improve the outcome that this patient's going to survive, go back to their family, go back to their life. So damage control resuscitation evolved with damage control surgery. And damage control surgery is surgery that when we get a trauma patient, just got to take control as quickly as possible of the major life-threatening problems and that typically involves opening them up from their sternum to their pubis and just get wide exposure and quickly packing all the critical quadrants of the abdomen and then looking for the bleed and correcting it. And the severely injured patients that need damage control surgery really lack the physiological reserve to take and do a complete surgical fix of everything in one operation. And what limits that is the lethal triad. It's where their body temperature is going, where their coagulation profile is going, and where their acid-base balance is going. So it was found a few decades ago that this is the way to go. If you have to take one of these patients in, you just do a quick open, pack, fix the life-threatening problems, and then leave them open, take them back to the ICU, get them warm, get them resuscitated better, and then go back to the OR for the definitive repairs. And sometimes these patients have to bounce back and forth several times in that first 24 or 48 hours, but this saves more lives than bringing in the orthopedics to do their fix at the same time or just trying to do a fancy repair. So that is proven and that works, but if you don't receive the patient that they can even tolerate getting through the DCS, the damage control surgery, it's not a lot to work with. So we push out the damage control resuscitation to the ER and to the trauma room, and now it makes sense to see it start the pre-hospital phase. And all along the way, 
this lethal triad that we talk about, you losing blood, losing body temperature, becoming coagulopathic, getting acidotic, it keeps going from the point of injury through the pre-hospital phase to the trauma room into the OR. So everybody's got a chance to make their difference, but it really starts um, with the pre-hospital phase. Is this sort of familiar or just something touched on by people in the past? Is, is this new terminology for many people here when I talk about the lethal triad of trauma? Some people have some familiarity with it, but what I want to do is take it so you understand. Um, you know, classically, our basic definition of shock, right from EMT school, before we're even medics, is inadequate tissue perfusion. But what really happens with inadequate tissue perfusion, right? We're not getting enough oxygen carrying blood to the cells. So we've got this great redundancy that our cells operate the best in the presence of oxygen, but they're not gonna immediately die um, because there's a second mechanism. So they normally work the best in the presence of oxygen at a certain level. If the oxygen level gets low, they'll go from this aerobic metabolism into anaerobic, meaning there's limited or no oxygen. When they're in a the normal state, like all of us in the room, there's a clean byproduct to aerobic metabolism and there's no buildup of um, lactic acid and we're able to generate heat. If we bleed out and we don't get adequate oxygen to the cells, we switch the mechanism to anaerobic metabolism. Anaerobic metabolism has a dirty byproduct, which is lactic acid, which changes the pH of our body, lowers our pH, makes us acidotic. And we don't have that ability to generate heat. So trauma patients get cold for a whole different mechanism outside of the environment. So we see hypothermia in trauma patients in a different scale. You know, we act sooner um, before they get colder. And this happens across whether it be a desert in Iraq or northern Vermont. It, it will happen with trauma patients. So as, as long as the temperature is less in the body, they're going to drop temperature. Um, and there's things that we do that can even drop it more, such as giving unwarmed fluids, particularly with blood, because we're storing blood refrigerated. If we give RSI medications and intubate and anesthesia, all this stuff drops the body temperature. Then when we get to the OR, we open up this big body cavity, and there's no way to control that heat loss. We drop the body temperature. So everybody in the chain of care, starting with EMS, everything you do along the way to preserve that one degree drop is very meaningful to the patient because we have a narrow window. So to put this in perspective, why is this trauma-induced hypothermia very different than primary hypothermia? If I was in the hospital here and I had a, um, a primary hypothermia patient who's not injured come in and their core temperature was 90 degrees Fahrenheit or less, I would only expect that most of 21% death rate or mortality rate if I received a trauma patient who was in shock and their temperature was 90 degrees or less, I would expect 100% uh, of those patients to die if they arrived at that temperature. And that's proven out with looking at thousands of patients in the trauma registry. The first kind of landmark paper came out on this way back in 1987. And it just hasn't been, I don't think, pushed enough on the civilian side. The military providers kind of got this early on and made it part of their doctrine and dogma. Well, on the civilian side. And we use a much lower, I mean, sorry, a much higher cutoff when we define hypothermia and trauma. We think of a body temperature of 96.8 as the person's heading into hypothermia when they're traumatic. So that's not a, a very big range. And again, what happens is as the body just goes down a few degrees, we go from normal clotting to very impaired clotting. It doesn't take, take long to get there. So this case is a case where we had compressible and non-compressible hemorrhage, and this guy got shot 32 times, which is incredible. It's the most gunshot wounds I've ever seen somebody survive from. All of the extremities and, and four in the torso, and he was kind of like our first patient in near uh, arrest situation. He was out in the snow. This was February. 
got shot on the street, multiple shooters. New radio pulses, you had a crowd of pulse of 120, so we assume this pressure to be 60 or greater. Um, most of the external bleeding seemed to be coming from a leg, so they put a cat tourniquet, they decompressed his chest, they put on warm blankets, they gave him a whole, they gave him a whole blood on the inline warmer, they put a humeral IO in for access, um, and took him to our trauma center. And again, we received this patient, and his initial blood pressure was 84 over 52, so he's still on the very low end. We start a massive transfusion protocol. So this is a term I want to introduce you to. You know, a transfusion is what you'll do. You're going to give a unit of blood. That's a transfusion. Massive transfusion gets defined as the patient who receives four units in the first hour or 10 over 24 hours is considered massive transfusion. So by and large with EMS, unless you had a couple of um, extended scene time and you have a helicopter and a couple of ground units, you're not really going to get into the massive transfusion protocol, but it happens and you know, me and Dave were just talking about this, some other things that have to happen if we're doing a massive transfusion on the ground, like adding calcium to it. And we, one of the systems I'm involved with that uses our warmer actually has had twice now in the year that they've given eight units to a single patient in the field, free hospital on entrapments, but they've got a uh, number of blood assets that are fairly close to each other, they can get that much blood. So this patient comes in, and this is the note from the trauma attending is that, you know, he had his hands full obviously, but he opened this guy's torso, got control of the bleeding, identified him, and he makes a note to say, you know, I had a blood gas of 7.1, you know, his pH is 7.1, his temp had gotten down to 92.5 Fahrenheit in the OR, and that they decided to just stop the surgery, take him to the ICU, and went back multiple times after that, and this guy survived. But again, we just reviewed this with the medics two weeks ago, and you know, all of this is a bundle of care, right? This is damage control resuscitation. So just because you have blood, that's not what is entirely gonna save the patient. It's gonna make a huge impact. But you can't forget the basics. Stop the bleeding, try to get you know, good access, minimize your exposure that the patient's gonna have in the environment, retain heat, warm, Airway, um, and they eventually went to a humoral IO to get better you know, access. Some of the slides we just showed training were representative like, of some of his extremity explosive injuries in his chest. He's got you know, blood up in here, chest tubes, and bilateral, you know, he's in tough shape. So, this physiology of temperature loss and trauma, just to kind of wrap up on the sleep and triad that we have shock, inadequate tissue perfusion. This leads to decreased aerobic metabolism, which is the clean metabolism that lets us generate heat, switches over to anaerobic metabolism, which has a dirty byproduct that makes us acidotic, and it limits our ability to generate heat. We don't typically expect, with the mass of the body, that we're going to really rewarm patients as much, at least with older studies that looked at, hey, if we just warm crystalloid IV fluids and we did a couple of interventions, we don't really see big trends. We know if we did warm it, they'd cool more. So we usually kind of set this goal line of we just don't want the patient to get colder in the pre-hospital phase. This group I was just telling you about in South Carolina that's done all these transfusions, I've been six months on their study group with them, and interestingly, they have a rewarming trend on their patients. And they basically use the set of views for warming their blood. They put a ready heat blanket on the patient, which is one of these, looks like it feels like a paper blanket that's got a catalyst to generate heat when you open the package. And I think one of the explanations that we've talked about with them is of why do they see a rewarming trend, contrary to previous literature over 20 years, is adding blood into these patients. We're correcting this because we're giving them the ability to switch from anaerobic back to aerobic because we're giving them back a fluid and a volume expander that carries the oxygen, promotes the clot to stop the bleed, to raise the blood pressure slightly but in a meaningful way and kind of reverse this process. And the earlier that's done, the better for the patient. Environmental exposure 
is something that really has to be looked at. And this picture from the marathon, you know, shows you all the ways that patients, I think just as a start to show you that, you know, you've got blood loss, you're against a very conductive environment here of concrete that really pulls heat away, transfers heat away. You've got the fluid on the patient that's going to evaporate and cool. Um, so we really want to be super cognizant of this. And I think most everybody intuitively does this, but there's a few other steps. You know, you get into the back of the truck, and if that's not uncomfortably warm to you as a provider, it's not warm enough for this kind of a patient. So you really have to allow yourself to be uncomfortable with the heat in the back of the rig. When I was at Parkland in Dallas, when you closed three of the trauma room doors, it set the thermostat to ADF. So as soon as we closed the doors with the trauma patient, the heat came up. I mean, it's a pain when you're in the gowns and you know, you're know you in a warm part of the country, but you really want to try to keep these patients warm. Another point here is going back to your physiology lectures in medic school is that this is the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, which just really tells us when oxygen is held by hemoglobin and it's going to get unloaded into the tissue, there's certain things that change it. So carbon monoxide, we'll bring this over to the left. That's kind of the more classic thing we learn in medic school is that you've got enough oxygen, that's why you think, but it's down to the hemoglobin and it's not unloading where it needs to go. But we also found if the patients are cold, it will shift to the left. And then even if you're supplementing the oxygen, if they're still in a hypothermic state, it's not going to get out to the tissue and reverse this change that we're getting into the anaerobic metabolism. So just another reason we bundle, we warm the blood as we're giving it, we try to keep the patient at least in hemostasis and potentially reborn. Any questions about that so far? not trying to make it too technical, but I always find with medics at this level, it's great to go back and review the physiology. You know, you read it again and others, and as you go along in this blood program, a lot of you are gonna be curious and look at other sources, and you're gonna see what I'm telling you and what Chief Brodell is gonna tell you has coming up time and time again. And I always found when I was learning, the more I heard it, the, 